The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment together, this divine moment. May you lead us with the Holy Spirit in all truth. Jesus, be our rabbi. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so it's been a while since we were together. Welcome back uh, to those of you that have been on this journey through 1 Thessalonians and those of you just joining us tonight. Uh, this is an exegetical verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. And we are technically starting at verse 9 based on where we left off a few weeks ago. Uh, but for the sake of continuity and context, we'll actually begin at verse 1 of chapter 5. And Lyndon, please read the entire chapter 5 for us. I feel like traditional penance, but that's all right. Try to come up higher. <laughs> but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that, need that I write unto you. For yourselves know put perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light, and the children of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, and do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, <coughs> warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all, appearance of, from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, but also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, by way of review, since it's been a while since we were together, some of you are new tonight. This is a church that was persecuted and had only had Paul with them for three Sabbaths, so about three weeks. And he planted this church, and off he went in the face of persecution, and this is a love letter, really. He commends their faith in so many ways, and we'll see more of that tonight in the fifth chapter. So we'll begin at verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. So let's start with verse 9 and go through those two verses. And then into verse 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's break that first down. The first part. For God did not appoint us to wrath. So what is that saying? God appointed us to something. Well, here it's, I have it. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. So God doesn't want us to suffer the wrath, but to receive salvation. So what is wrath? This is a large concept in the gospel, isn't it? 
<laughs> Jesus took the cup of wrath that we might have the cup of blessing, salvation. So as Paul's talking about wrath here, uh, the word in the Greek used means a settled, heated anger. It's not just a momentary, impulsive thing. It's a settled, heated anger. But what does it mean? Why is wrath a concept in this context? Could it be oppression? Pardon me? Could it be oppression? Oppression? Well, what's the human condition? What is the problem that Christ came to save us from? So we're deserving of wrath based upon our fallen nature and our sin? Absolutely. Yeah, our brokenness in the garden. If it, if it wasn't for God in Christ, we would have probably destroyed ourselves. Already. This verse is telling us there's been an intervention. That there's been an appointment. That we were headed one way, but we've been appointed to something else. And that is to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Not through works of the law, or good behavior, or figuring it out and doing it the right way, but through an intervention. Let's think about what happened with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you remind us what, what happened as he was anticipating going to the cross? The cup. Yes, the cup. The cup of wrath. Which was symbolic of wrath. <clears throat> Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, he prayed. So that was the moment where what Paul would talk about later as the appointment to not wrath, but to salvation, that was the moment. Jesus obeyed the Father's will. And so in verse 10, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Why would Paul put those words down, awake or asleep, especially as you think about what we've studied so far in this letter. Alive or dead. What was one of their concerns? We looked at that in previous chapters. Dying before, <coughs> dying before the coming of Christ, the second coming. Those who had fallen asleep as they were awaiting the return of Christ. Another usage of this word wrath in the Greek is Matthew 3.7, where John the Baptist looked at the Pharisees and Sadducees and he said, You brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. So this concept of, of wrath is very real. And so humanity has essentially built up a series of charges against <coughs> humanity's existence itself based upon our fallenness. And that's where this intervention of salvation comes. We will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. So if we take those three verses, what are we hearing? I think the... Uh, the they, they understand the, the history of the Jewish people as well uh, in writing this and knowing how any time they've kind of gone uh, their separate way from God, the uh, things occur that are not to their advantage. And only through, you know, brotherhood and unity have the Jews, you know, has to have the, even the Jews and, and them themselves, <coughs> will they prosper. So a divided house you know, can't stand. Also, I think they're, they're on the right track. As, as, as before, it's just as in fact you're already doing it. So they, they know what they need to do. Build each other up, encourage each other. <coughs> so it's a reinforcement of maintaining the family or the group of people who 
of uh, living together as, as Christians? Similar to what Paul wrote to Timothy when he said, fan the flame of faith that is within you. So we do that all the time in this church, by the grace of God. We, we fan the flame of faith in each other. That's what we're doing right now by studying the Word. Encouraging each other. These three verses are quite succinct in terms of the gospel message, don't you think? We have in verse 9 that we've been appointed not to wrath but to salvation through Christ. Verse 10 tells us something that he died for us. Why is that important? Why is that the essential next step? Okay, break it down. He died for us. Verse 11. So that, no matter what our state is, alive or dead, we'll be together with him. And Paul has said forever. We'll be with him forever. That's been a recurring thing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So that, that's the gospel right there, essentially. And therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as you're already doing. So how might we do that on a daily basis in this place? doing right now. Yeah. This is a perfect example of people, people getting together to uh, study, the, study the scriptures and learn more about that. I remember hearing a priest talk about the fact that he was once an admiral in the Navy before he became a priest, and he wow. was on a ship at the time of the Iranian hostage crisis, and he was describing the fact that he was ready to, to launch weapons and President Carter at the time called it off, so he was that close to that moment. And he was really upset. And he said, I don't deserve that. And a friend of his, who I think was the chaplain on the Navy ship, said, what you deserve is death. <laughs> and that was really the first moment he thought about what that really meant, that what we really deserve is death. So anything apart from that is a gift. And that's what Paul's saying, right? We're not appointed to death or wrath. We could be, should be, but instead, by the grace of God, we're appointed to salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's all about perspective, right? So if we, we can help each other by reminding one another of what the cost was for Christ and what a gift we have of what he's done for us. Verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Let's camp out on those two verses. So uh, verse 12 um, connects us to Acts 14.23, and if Ray would please read that. This is Paul ordaining leaders in that context. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. Okay, so in the early church, there was leadership, of course, raised up. And Paul's continuing that whole theme of how to support your leaders. Now we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So in the Thessalonian church, there were leaders who had been raised up, and they needed prayer. And what follows that, but being at peace among yourselves, which would suggest that there could be division, right? Verse 14, and we exhort you, brothers, warn those who are lazy, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Three or four weeks ago, we looked at about that portion of, of the fourth chapter about loving and working, and Paul talks about to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands. And that was partly because a lot of these folks had given up their jobs because they thought Jesus was coming again in their lifetime. At least that's some speculation on the part of scholars. We've seen that throughout history. Some people have just decided that they're just going to wait on Jesus and let everything go. Now it's happening very possibly even then. And so Paul is reminding them to, to keep working. And remember that 
you know, hard labor or even just skilled labor uh, was not something that the elite engaged in. And so Paul's making the point that there's a lot of dignity in work, especially in the Christian community, where there is no division between social classes. We all work together. And so that was, in a sense, radical, that those who were not considered part of the elite community were being lifted up and all living together, people with different skills and trades. Keep in mind that Jesus was a technon, which is a Greek word, which means skilled craftsman. He probably was a, not just a carpenter, but a bricklayer. He repaired roofs. Especially after those guys broke open the, the lower the trend down. Maybe he stuck around. Oh, now I got a pair of this thing. <laughs> Warn those who are lazy, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Doesn't that describe your average church at some level? Some people are, okay, maybe not working that hard. Some people are discouraged. Others are weak. We all need patience with each other. Seems very real, doesn't it? Real pastoral guidance. So he goes from being deeply theological to very practical. And we're reminding ourselves that this letter and the second letter Paul writes to the Thessalonians are examples of letters of encouragement where other letters Paul writes are encouraging but they're also letters of admonishment, correction. But not in this case. They were doing things very well. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Such wisdom. Such wisdom that seems very consistent with Jesus' teaching. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, where Jesus talks about what reality should look like for the kingdom of God and its children. To be meek, peacemakers. Remember what they said about him as he was crucified. This man's done nothing wrong. We deserve the just penalty for our sins, but he's done nothing wrong. Yeah, the thief on the cross. Is the um, point that he says? I don't know if that's what he put about the. Uh, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything. Uh, is he sort of saying that since uh, Christ has, had come, that uh, there were no more prophecies to be fulfilled? Uh, what verse is that? That's at the very end. 18, the, uh, 19, 18, 19. 18, 19. Yeah. The 19 and the 20. Yeah, okay. We'll get to that, but let me just say that it's not clear if he's talking about Old Testament prophecies. It's more likely he's talking about the gift of prophecy, mm -hmm. such as was used in Corinth, where there could be a lot of disunity based around that expression of the spirit of gift. Okay. We'll get to that. It's a good question. So. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because the way the, the way we have versified this this section, 13, the be at peace among yourselves, because it shows up on the back end of 13, almost it, it, it is in a, it kind of gets lost in the muddle, but if I were doing a literary, kind of looking at this from a literary analysis perspective, I would almost say that be at peace among yourselves is really almost the first sentence of, of these next couple of verses, because this is what it means to be at peace among yourselves. Is is admonishing the you know it, it's really to to care for the community in their particular needs. Admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. Don't repay evil for evil. Always seek to do, do good to one another and to all. It's almost be at peace among yourselves, and then seek to do good to one another and to all. It's almost like that book ends that little bit. We should never underestimate the power of that one verse, be at peace among yourselves. I mean, think about that. If we were at peace among ourselves all the time, versus being in division, how different that would be. 
So we give thanks for the peace that we do have because it's a gift of God. Centered on Christ. And if we could always remember that God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through Christ, peace should flow over division. Peace pisses some people off, though. I first came to counsel every day. Sorry. Important to share the peace. And one thing that's important to remember, too, is that Paul's talking about a Christian community, not being out in the world sharing peace with anybody. I mean, that's a wonderful thing to do. But this is specific to Christians, brothers and sisters, but brothers, as he calls them, living together. With the assumption that they're all in Christ, that they should know better. And so they should be able to follow these admonishments. Be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Do unto others as you would have them do to you, right? Okay, uh, can I read the analogy in here on uh, 14? Uh, this is pretty good, I think. Um, don't loaf around with the idle. Warn them. Don't yell at the timid and the weak. Encourage them and help them. At times, it can be difficult to distinguish between idleness and timidly, timidity. Uh, two people may be doing nothing, one out of laziness and the other out of shyness or fear of doing something wrong. The key to ministry is sensitivity, sensing the condition of each person and offering the appropriate remedy for each situation. You can effectively help until you, you can't effectively help until you know the problem. You can't apply the medicine until you know where the wound is. So you. <clears throat> You know, find out where they're at, and then go about it. You know, appropriately, or how you see fit. I mean, that sounded. It made a lot of sense to me. I like that question yeah. about find out where the wound is. Because right. Oftentimes, when we're acting in a way that we would not be proud of, or maybe someone else is, one thing we can ask ourselves is, where does it hurt? Mm. And if you ask yourself that about someone else's behavior, that right. will help you. Yeah. Why are you not at peace? Address them spiritually. Right. right. Where does it hurt? Because most of us act out of hurt when we're acting badly. Mm -hmm. Where did you get that spot from? Right. Um, is that your uh, spot? Just follow <clears throat> <clears throat> it. Just it analyzes um, each oh, verse. Good. Yeah, mm. it's really good. Well, the next three verses are very important, and we do quote these a lot in and out of church. Rejoice always. Pray constantly or pray without ceasing, based on your translation. Give thanks in everything for all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is great for us to be reading this and taking it in. <laughs> because left to our own nature. <laughs> this is not us. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So let's take these one at a time. Verse 16. Rejoice always. What does that look like? In all circumstances, no matter what's happening. Always be thankful. Be thankful for whatever it is. Including bad things, right? Right. How does that work? How are you able to see a situation that you might describe as bad or unfavorable and find a way to rejoice in it? What perspective are you looking at to find that ability? What, <clears throat> what went wrong to get the bad results? What am I going to learn to improve so that I, I can now, back to myself, provide a better service, provide whatever as a result? Joseph in Genesis 15 said that what you did for evil, uh, speaking to his brothers, that it turned out for a good. He saved the nation. God used him to save the Egyptian nation and the world in some respect with uh, uh, holding the, uh, the grain. So God used something bad. Same thing with uh, Romans 8. All things work together for good for those who love God and call by his name. And, and I also feel that rejoicing always it goes beyond 
reasons and causes and effects and explanations. Rejoicing always is, is, a, is a stance. It's sitting in the heart of the sacred. It is no matter what is going on, God is there. We trust he's going to make it right, whatever happens. And, and, and so rejoice always because always, always it's God. That seems to be what God says to Elijah in the cave when he thinks, I'm by myself, or, you know, they're going to kill me, and uh, the still small voice. It seems to be saying, don't you know I have this? Like, I'm, I'm in control here. I have this. Yeah. Yeah. Go back, he says. You know, I have this. So that's the perspective, I guess. All the more so, excuse me, um, based on what we just read earlier in chapter 5, uh, where our destiny happens. Knowing how it's all going to end up it helps change your perspective. Mm -hmm. you see from the worst perspective. I'd like to read a fairly long quote, which has uh, with it the meaning of what we call providence. Providence is a term used to describe God's ability to orchestrate the innumerable contingencies that exist in the universe and make them all work together for your good in time and your glory in eternity. God literally orchestrates every, every single piece of space, matter, time, force, and energy so that it all congeals in a perfect plan and purpose. Every thought, every word, every act by every being that exists, every natural, every supernatural thing moves together to fit the perfect plan of God, even though from their own viewpoints, they are an innumerable number of independently acting agencies. Simply stated, it's summed up in these words, all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. No matter what's going on in your life, there ought to be unceasing thanks and joy over the divine providence as God orchestrates everything for your good and eternal glory. Sounds like John MacArthur. Is that John MacArthur? It's actually uh, one of his research assistants. Mm -hmm. I don't have his name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good. No, I'm just guessing. I <laughs> like, guess that commentator. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise, all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Mm -hmm. Know that the Lord is, he is God. It is he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for all generations. One of the things that's always hit me about thanksgiving, um, and it was uh, something that, that came up during a, a worship leaders conference that was at several years ago, um, actually over the 9-11 the, the week when that all happened, I was down at this conference and um, one of the things that the, um, one of the leaders had us do was when we went back to our hotel rooms in the evening and said, I want you to give thanks to the Lord tonight, it, you know, and, and do nothing but that. Don't, you know, don't pull up the list of you know, pray for this person, pray for this spirit, just give thanks. He said, I want you to pray for an hour and give thanks. And, and when you come back tomorrow, tell me what your experience was. And what I found was amazing was that Thanksgiving really does, as, as the scripture see, says here, it, it really brings us into the presence of God. We enter his gates and it is courts of praise. That is just a Figurative, it's, it, it, I think it really is in, in an eternal way when we're in when we're in Thanksgiving that we we are able to enter into the presence mm -hmm. of God, and I think it's it's just it was tremendous. We we all reported back that we had experienced um, just something really wonderful in that time um, of Thanksgiving, and you know, and we all joked about how. You know, you, you had to every once in a while stop yourself because you're get, getting off on something else that you're praying for and you realize, no, you just want to give thanks. 
and, you know, and, and you focus on that. And that was, uh, it was really um, true. I mean, the scripture is really true about coming into God's presence. Thanks, Gary. Just a little important, just a little history slash tradition lesson is that that Psalm 100 and it's very similar to Psalm 95 are, are, the, are the, the opening psalms that are appointed for morning prayer. So if the church invites us to start each day with those psalms for exactly those reasons. I can see why you like that song because as a musician, you come in closest to God with a song. <coughs> that leaves us who can't sing kind of out in the cold. At least we can <laughs> praise in the court, but not we can't come into the presence of a song. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Terry Fulham on saying it says, "Make a joyful noise to the Lord." He says, <laughs> 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 "Noise." <laughs> 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 so we all had a heart, not with a voice. So what if we took an hour and gave thanks? That'd be powerful. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to pray constantly? <clears throat> Not just on Sunday morning, but all throughout the day. I know I pray constantly throughout the day for, you know, for help, doing things. Thanks. Uh, and I'm thankful when, when they work out and thankful when they don't work out because it's, you know, it just keeps me going. But yeah, I do talk to so God. So when things don't work out and you're thankful, what happens next? Oh, uh, eventually they work out. <laughs> Not in my time, but eventually it would be. But more, it's more like a conversation, I guess, with God and Jesus, as opposed to just praying, but you know, constantly in conversation with so God. So life as prayer. Yeah. Yeah, just mm -hmm. talking to him like you and I are talking. I think you, uh, for example, one thing I like how the I really enjoy this discussion of prayer, the results of prayer, and so on. And we sing it and we sing it. But the more uh, we live doing these things, and meaning they're doing, learning and reading, the more it means actually sometimes uh, when I have a certain problem or a family situation, and somehow certain wording and themes and songs that come to your mind. And, and they're, 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 they were written for that specific concern of this child. I think God had been written for everybody to have things to say. And it meant to be, the meaning is exactly the same, and it's meant to be the same. And the wonderful thing is that things are going to do the same. And I just find it, you know, I think it's just like So, like, you, you heard about something yesterday, and I'm saying, saying, boy, I'm about forever, and then, you know, it's just kind of a little bit. Did you, did you pray about this thing? Did you mean you pray about the uh, problem that exists for as long as it exists? When that comes forth for all of it? You know, you know, it's good to pray in. It's just to remind yourself yourself that you have prayed for it. But it's, it's important to remember, hey, I pray for it already. Does that mean I pray for it already? I was already here. Yeah. I'm not going to pray about anything now. Don't pray about me. Say, God, thank you for this. This is the prayer I prayed to you yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I like us to only be very confirming in what we say and really is. Like I'm there. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's not going to pay attention. I'm just 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 going to pay attention. Thanks, John. It's interesting. Praying continually is about praying continuously. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. 
think, I think it's, it's not as much a, um, just what you were saying, you know, it's, it's sort of that, that living awareness of God's presence. And so you're, 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 you're there, you're, you're with him and you're, you know, praying, praying sometimes it's just a, a, a thanks that you give for a moment or something that works out well or, um, just, you know, something you hear down the hallway about someone who's, who's still on the, anything, oh, pray for that person. You just, it's just that constant mindfulness of, of God's presence and that you have that access. And you exercise it. I'll tell you, you know, what gets me through sometimes is the music from Sunday. I was last week, I, went, I kept going through uh, over and over my head. I, I lean not on my own understanding mm -hmm. of my life. <clears throat> it's in the hands of the maker of heaven. I just kept mm -hmm. saying that over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say what Bill said. Um, it's an acknowledgement of his presence constantly. <clears throat> when you pray, you got him in your mind. And, you know, whether you're playing for uh, good to happen or no bad things to happen, um, you're acknowledging his presence. That's, I think that's what it's really all about. I agree. I love you know, the course of the day. It's like thank you, praise you, and help me. Because you're in a situation. Help me. Thank you. Just a simple prayer. Verse 19, don't stifle the spirit. What other translations do you have? Do not put out the spirit's fire. Do not put out the spirit's fire. Restrain. Nice. What do you think that means in this context? Don't give up. You know, don't let the the flame go out. You know, continue to worship. question I would ask is, can we actually quench the spirit? Really? Something about our behavior can affect how we respond to the Holy Spirit, but can we actually, we really have the power to quench the spirit? Isn't that the uh, unpardonable sin? Well, that's living against the Holy Spirit, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Denying it. <coughs> If the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth, you can deny the truth. That would be a question of the Spirit. If you lead you to the Lord and you don't go to the Lord, that's ignoring the Spirit. That's the same as question of that. In this context, wouldn't it be that the Spirit of God is, is um, pulling us to, um, to give thanks, to pray, you know, trying to infuse that joy, and um, if we put that fire out, it's just prodding us, he's pulling us all the time. We want to cooperate. We're not. So discipleship and the obedience therein is an important part of being step of the spirit. But if you I'm sorry. But if you left the community, wouldn't you in essence be quenching the spirit as an individual? If you left the community? Yes. Okay, the world doesn't want us to have a spirit. The world doesn't want to be away from spirit. Understood. But I think the question was, how would you quench the spirit? I, I, I think it, it, in that case becomes a matter of, I'm going to call the community, leave in the community. That's something I can suppose. That's well, a very interesting insight, especially when we think about being at peace with one another, being unified. And Psalm 133 reminds us how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. There's the Spirit. Like oil running down the beard of Aaron's, and that's an image of the Holy Spirit. So unity and the Spirit's presence are one and the same. I was going to say also that when we walk in the flesh, we are quenching the Spirit because it tells us that we can walk in the Spirit. If you're going to live by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. It must be possible if you're warned against it. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. 
So we don't know exactly what kind of prophecies were being presented in this Christian community. But we do know one thing. There's a way to test all things, and how do we do that? <coughs> and we have the whole counsel of God in the New Testament. They did not have that. They had the Old Testament scriptures. Many of these people were probably Jewish. And they had Paul's revelation. So they could test it against what they had. And the word canon, and we call this the canon of scripture, the word canon means measuring rod in, the, in its Latin use. So the church would measure everything against the canon of scripture, the measuring rod. And we do that today. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every form of evil. That's a daily test. And towards evil is a way to punch the spirit. Yeah, that, that's what I was say. It's, it, you know, for me, the, the do not put out the, the Spirit's fire, you know, so much of things that happen outside, uh, you know, in your daily life, you know, is, you know, is a test to put out that fire, to put out that Spirit. And, um, you know, there are times that you kind of get to a point where you don't feel that there's something there. And, you know, you really need to reassociate yourself with Daily. So I have this image, to your point, of a coal fire. And if you separate one coal, what happens? It goes out. But together, the heat is powerful. So that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Linda, your point about if you go away, what happens? We need each other in Christian community. Hebrews tells the people who receive that letter, Continue meeting together. Don't neglect the fellowship of God. Yeah, church is God's idea. It's not a man-made. It's not like the Chamber of Commerce came up with it. You know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> <not too bad. laughs> you know. so That's interesting. What is the church? The body of Christ. We're living stones put together. Okay, so I'm a realist. Can you define it for me? It's, 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 body, it's the body of Christ on, on earth. He's already ascended, and the Holy Spirit has come down to be with us. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're living stones put together. If we were just scattered, you know, we have these, all these rock walls running all over New England. I like, I like them because they're kind of like organized from chaos, and they're kind of monuments to the, putting these things back together again. And so we're, we're together. We're, we're, we're formidable put together as, as living stones. But if we were scattered, it would just be uh, just chaos. I guess I was trying to get to it's the people in the room, it's not the room. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. And the word <laughs> ecclesia in the Greek, which is church, and its etymology means those called out of something in something. So we're called out of evil, wrath, the world, the world into this sacred body of Christ. Yeah, they organized and uh, ordered put back in order. You know, God's got a order. I don't think I'll ever think uh, about stone walls the same way again after that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's get into Paul's final benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stop with that. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his eternal covenant. That's from Peter. So we have a similar point here by Paul. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Not partially, but completely. And how are we sanctified? walking with Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, which He has sent. In fact, in the Eucharist, we say that, and sanctify us. We say that. Make us holy. Jesus said in uh, in John, um, was it 17, 17, He said, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth.
So body, soul, and spirit are together here. That's very important. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or body, mind, and spirit. So the word body is soma. The word mind is psyche, where we get psychology from. And pneuma is spirit. So we're body, mind, and spirit. And we need to remember that because sometimes we neglect one. It could be the body, don't take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit, or we're quenching the spirit, or the mind is not being renewed by the word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Paul would write in another context, in another church. So John, to your point about your word is truth, sanctify them with the word. So we're feeding the mind and the spirit right now together, just as we feed the body in another way, by studying the word. So when we die, the body dies, right? Not the mind. Mind and spirit. What's, what happens there based upon what we know from Scripture? That's the other What did Jesus say from the cross? To you I commend my spirit, and to thy hands I commend my spirit. Mm -hmm. So the spirit went with his body, died. In his resurrection, they were all brought back together. And the New Testament shows us that that will be the same with us, even though the body dies. And Paul is dealing with this in this letter. Everything is reunited and reformulated for the resurrection that we'll be able to recognize each other with new spiritual bodies, where everything's back and whole. Sorry? Whole. whole. No, no sickness, no broken bones, no. God will wipe every tear. So Paul is showing us the importance of addressing and knowing and caring for these three components of what makes us what we are, body, mind, and spirit. Last Sunday, we had the section from 1 Corinthians where Paul says, essentially, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Glorify God with your, your temple. Was he addressing the idea, the notion of, uh, well, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want. Was that was, was he addressing that to the Corinthians, or was, was it some other point? I'm not sure what their motivation was in some of those sinful behaviors with the body, yeah. uh, but there was plenty of that going on. Um, I guess that's why he didn't mention it. Temple prostitution is the context for that, um, which was going on in Thessalonica too. Really? <clears throat> but not, you're, you're talking about the temple, the pagan temples. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Ritualized sexuality, basically. So if we talk about body, mind, and spirit, there's a purpose to be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul's focus throughout this letter, isn't it? The return of Christ. Okay, verse 24. This is important. Doctrine. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So we've had a lot of encouragement from Paul to act certain ways. But doesn't this say it all? He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So there's a limit to what we can humanly do. Salvation is God's gift. He does it. I like what you said just today about uh, God doesn't call those who are able. He, he makes able those that he calls. First Corinthians is not one night. It says, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. So it's through Christ that we, can do, that we can do this. It seems impossible. Like these other things, it seems impossible. Where it says, pray continually. Or be at peace with everybody all the time. Or be perfect. But it's through Jesus we can do these things. So the starting point is the salvation message. And everything else flows from that. Versus, do all these things, and then you'll get the salvation. No, it's right. Like, yeah, it's, it's that you're first you're made able, and then you can do it. 
That's an important distinction. A lot of people think it's the other way around. That's why we're in the Word together studying, to get it clear, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you just had this section, verses, say, 16 uh, through 21, 22, if it was out of context, you'd be like, well, I've got to really work hard for this. I've got to work hard, or try harder, struggle more, strive. But that's not the whole context. This is the outflow of the fact that we've been appointed for salvation. It's happened. And nothing can separate us from Christ. That's, more, that's more of a context than you have like in the Sermon on the Mount, where he's saying all these things that are just <laughs> above our capacity to do. But he starts out with blessed are the poor in spirit. Like you can't do these things, so it's only through me. We have more of an explanation here than we do in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. The same message was at least in part only there in the Psalms that he's quoting here, or he's reinforcing and elucidating here. I find it really comforting to know that God is faithful. That God is always standing by me. God is always standing by us. No matter what, God will always come through. That, that just... I, I don't know any other words for that. That just... You know, in, in a world where we are so often let down, where, where maybe sometimes in our deepest beings we have felt abandoned by people we love when we have been hurt, we have, when, when, when we feel alone. God is always standing there faithfully through all of that. And, and I, just find, I just find that God's faithfulness to be deeply, deeply comforting. He's a rock. You know? <laughs> He's the rock. I don't know Peter is called the rock, but really it's Jesus is the rock. It made Peter able to be the rock. I even touched on that the sermon a little bit. And, and, and then that he will do this. That in other words, it, God is going to hold us together as, in, as, as uh, our whole be this whole being of mind, soul, and body that sometimes we start feeling like we're falling apart. God is faithful. God will hold us together. That's grace. That's the grace. That's God's grace to those who can copy something like that. When he says something, he says it because it was true 20,000 years in the past and it's true 20,000 years in the future. It's true for you. So he doesn't have to say anything else. Now, people say, oh, I don't know. Most of it, most people die here. Yeah, God would really say something. Sometimes somebody who really they hurt me two times. God should come and punch them too. So they, 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 God says, Joe, if you do not come to believe in me, if you just don't hurt enough so much about it, you just don't want to believe in me. You go on and live with it, and you'll be the one you're in, and you'll die, and you'll be like, I'm going to go to church, going to people that the Joe is going to go to hell. And he has to turn his way and change his way. God's right. God says, I will. And he says, God's not going to hell. He says, he says, he will. But the next thing I think God is going to do is a joke. When you go to hell, in 20,000 years from now, you're going to say, thank you, God. You think they used to say that they'll trade you for something. 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 I'm down here. I can't stand it down here. I can't get out of here. Let's go. Okay. 
Pero yo pensaba, ¿no? Claro que no. Brothers, pray for us also. So that would be Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, who are writing this from Corinth. Greet all the brothers with the holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the brothers. So that must have been exciting. Thessalonians, this fledgling, yet at the same time very powerful small group of Christians receiving this parchment from Paul, the, the man they'd only been with about three weeks, and they read this very encouraging letter. And here we are, all these years later, getting so much out of it, which shows it's transcending the context historically. That's an important piece to it, but it really is applicable to all Christians everywhere. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Joe, to your point. Right. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's a wonderful way to end it. Does yours have, have an exclamation point at the end? I don't think we all use that. Some translators do that. Mm -hmm. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What does that mean? When you when you give someone the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, what does that convey? What does that say? Is love brother? transferred to, to you? If I give, truly give to somebody the grace of Christ. I just always feel that God's peace. And he, I've taken, I'm taking a total truth that God gave because it's the total truth he gave us. And he gave it in the best way he can give it to it. As he gave it to the person he wants to bless and give each one of us here to help bless that person. He said on the cross, he said, was it uh, Tadalestai? Paid, it's like you're getting the paid in full, you're getting a full tank of gas, you have, mm -hmm. you have you know, you're all set, it's all covered. Grace. Personally, for me, whenever I heard I hear that, it, it, it's actually very fulfilling, it's very calming. Mm -hmm. and it really does make you feel at one. Somebody once said, grace stands for God's rewards at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. Father Joe, you say that all the time. Grace and peace be with you. That's right. We figure if it's good enough for Paul and his churches, it's good enough for St. Paul's. In fact, we will begin next week with that very opening. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians 1, that's where that comes from. He uses it elsewhere too. And we're going to actually really get into it uh, because it's easy to skim over and say that's really wonderful. But actually the usage of his words are very important in terms of expressing certain theological doctrine. Yes? Is, is there actually a verb in that sentence? There is in, the, in English, but I think, I'm wondering if in Greek, is in other words, and this is important, this is exactly what you're saying because if, if this... The way I think this may read is the grace of our, another way to read this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with you. It is a declarative statement. Mm -hmm. Which is why some versions will have an exclamation point. But surely the verb is I wish you it's and then of grace. It's not really said. In, in it, so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I guess one, uh, one way to read it, there's different ways. One way to read it is that grace, grace with you. Is that what the, is that what the seminar is doing to you? Are <laughs> <laughs> you taking the English apart? No, I'm just... Well, the, word is, the verb isn't there. It's implied, but we don't know what exactly... I can't give grace. The point is, is that I can't give grace. No, but could I be interceding for someone who maybe is just standing there waiting? And opening the door to grace, and my opening their eyes to Christ, that for Christ is Lord. announcing grace with you. It's like an already an accomplished fact. It is. It is already there. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, gentlemen, you were assigned to help me with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Those of you that were contacted, we never even got to it. So be prepared for next week, okay?